very much. So, so my name is Craig Chamberlain, and I'm the director of algorithmic, algorithmic threat detection um, at Optics. What, what that means is I'm working on machine learning and anomaly detection techniques for, for detecting and hunting threats, um, especially threats that are sometimes hard to find or resistant to detection using, using conventional means. Um, so, at, so at Optics, we do a number of things. So we do um, things like cloud security posture management for major cloud providers um, like AWS, GSP, and Azure. Um, we do similar things for Kubernetes environments. We do endpoint logging and auditing and monitoring, and we also do um, threat detection, both for endpoint events um, and for cloud um, management layer API events like CloudTrail events. And what I want to talk about today is how we do um, how we use anomaly detection to supplement and extend our threat hunting and detection capabilities, specifically in the cloud API and the cloud services realm. Um, how we use anomaly detection to find things that sometimes are hard to find using conventional uh, search or query based detection. And so this this quote in the middle where it says. Um, the difficult for investigators to differentiate between threat active activity and ongoing legitimate activity. That, that is the best kind of problem statement that I've seen so far. Um, in, I've been working on this for, for, for several years now. So I've been working on threat hunting and detection for pretty much my entire career. Uh, I've been working on anomaly detection and machine learning uh, for, for several years now. And this is kind of the best simple problem statement in that what it comes down to is that in many cases, um, the difference between completely innocent and normal user activity day to day and threat actor activity that's taking place um, via credentialed access or compromised credentials, it's, it's often a matter of nuance. And sometimes it's the nuance is small enough that it's hard to see and it goes unnoticed, um, especially at scale where you may have millions or, or billions of events um, in your API logs on any given day. And there may just be, you know, just a very, just a handful that are um, that are illegitimate or, or suspicious and due to threat activity. And so we, we've got a few good examples in the public record. Um, I showed you the, so the latest ones here are, we had a case recently where a developer's, um, a developer's endpoint was compromised and their credentials were used to access extremely sensitive um, data and assets in a cloud account. And we had this case, um, that just actually went to, it's been in prosecution, and I believe it just actually went to conviction where it was kind of the first, um, not the first case where we've seen suspicious or credentialed access um, incidents, large scale incidents in cloud environments, but this might be the first public record one where it was of an actual case of insider threat, where we kind of, kind of a, a legitimate user gone rogue. So I'll show you more about what that looked like. Um, just to give you a kind of a lay of the land of where we're going. So. In cloud environments like AWS and Azure and GCP, um, there are places where we can use conventional security technologies like EDR agents, network security monitoring, and, and things like this that we're used to, even virtual, you know, virtual firewalls and things like that. Um, but they're limited to kind of one very small section of the cloud world. And they're mostly relevant to where we're running virtual machines. Uh, um, sometimes called, like in, in AWS, they're called EC2 virtual machines. Um, they can be relevant to, say, container workloads and things that resemble, a not exactly, but they they kind of look and feel like an operating system, and those can be instrumented um, with, with endpoint telemetry to an extent. Um, but apart from that, there's this whole other world of pure services for things like uh, there are data layer services, there are message queues, there are logging and instrumentation services, there are security services, there are even code execution services where you, you can do, you can actually build distributed systems without even running any virtual machines. And so, you know, these are areas where we really can't see what's going on there. We can't instrument them using um, endpoint ER agents or using network security monitoring or conventional tools. So the primary data source we have there are API logs. Um, because each time a user does a cloud transaction, there should be there. Now, once in a while, there's an exception to this, and usually it gets fixed, but there should be a record of that. It should be an audit trail for every um, transaction that every user, whether it's a human or a program, does in a cloud service. And so if we look at over the past few years, so to give you kind of some, some kind of concrete examples of, you know, what does this actually look like? Um, there have been a few 
big public record cases. And one of the first ones was, was back in 2016. Um, and the, this was a large intrusion set. Now this was, there were many dimensions to this intrusion set as, as some of you probably know. Um, and it was not purely a cloud intrusion set. There were many other dimensions to it, um, but there were, there were interesting kind of cloud dimensions to this intrusion set in this case, because one of the things that if you, and if you read the, um, if you read the indictments, which give some details about what went on, one of the things that went on was Apparently, the threat actors created um, in order to kind of forklift data out of the account. They they simply shared snapshots from the victim account to their own accounts, and there's nothing inherently um, there's nothing inherently you know strange or or um, dangerous or there's nothing inherently suspicious about sharing snapshots. It's something that especially as um, as third party vendors start moving in and doing things like agentless security scanning and various things. Um, sharing snapshots is becoming uh, very prevalent, and it's you know, it's completely normal most of the time. Um, but this was interesting because this was the first time we'd seen someone, I think, use the sharing of snapshots as a as a means of kind of bulk data exfiltration, and and this was something that could only really be seen using cloud API logs. Um, so then, in twenty nineteen, the then the in the financial services sector. There was another case, and this one is a bit more complex and had quite a quite a few moving parts. Um, the short version is what happened is um, somebody was able to kind of someone was able to pivot into an into a, a cloud account using a misconfigured web application firewall instance, and they were able to get code execution on the virtual server instance that was that was running a web application firewall, and then from there they were able to make calls to something called the metadata service. And the metadata service is just an informational service that's present in most cloud environments where a virtual machine can ask questions about itself and can get answers. And a virtual machine can only ask questions about itself because it's um, it's subject to a authentication authorization. Um, but one of the things that, so because they were able to um, kind of jump through these hoops and, and they were able to eventually get, make calls to the metadata service, they were able to obtain working credentials out of the metadata service and then take those credentials away and then use those to access uh, S3 or the simple storage service, um, which is essentially like a, a, a massive kind of bulk data storage and, and um, retrieval and access, um, basically a, a, a massive global system for storing and handling very large amounts of data. And they were able to, um, then using these credentials, they came back through um, at one point through, at least once through a, a VPN. And my understanding is there was also some, yeah, there was also some Tor activity in order to try and do some defense invasion and obfuscate where they were coming from. But you notice that um, I've, I've kind of circled something here in red because a lot of these cases, if you read these cases, a lot of these cases have a kind of a breadcrumb trail to ideas for anomaly detection. In this case, you know, why would a WAF role be accessing um, S3 and you know, calling what's, what's using what's called the list buckets command. Like, why does a WAF role want to access the bulk data storage service? Um, it doesn't have any reason to do that. It's probably never done that before. And so, you know, that transaction was in the logs, but um, being, you know, one event amongst probably billions, it would have been hard to find even for, for a good threat hunter um, at the time. So then in 2021, we had this, this is the, I think possibly one of the first big insider threat cases that we've seen in a cloud environment. <clears throat> Where in 2021, according to the public record and information, um, this legitimate user um, used their legitimate access to access bulk data uh, at, a, at a large technology company that they worked for. And um, in order to, to exfiltrate and move some data around and then engage in some, apparently they, um, delivered some kind of a ransom. They tried to ransom the data. And um, in the course of the investigation, you notice that there's there's another um, there's another transaction or command name here, like in, in these cloud APIs, um, what's when you call a method, a method is in, at least in AWS is called an action. And this particular action is called get caller identity, which is, and that's essentially like, like who am I in the endpoint world? It's essentially like, what is my current user context? Um, and you notice that they um, they they include that here as kind of a, a key detail of the forensic timeline that they reconstructed, um, because as as the user was user was coming in from 
in this case, again, from a VPN service in order to do some defense evasion and try to obfuscate their identity. Um, but, they, but they still needed to verify that they had the privileges that they thought they had in order to ob obtain their objections. So thinking about detection engineering, so, so how could we you know, detect some of these things? So when it comes to things like sharing snapshots, when you share a snapshot, there is an audit trail for that. However, with, as I mentioned, with the rise of third-party security and management services that are increasingly being utilized in cloud accounts and things like agentless security scanning, which we do agentless security scanning, others do it as well. And it's just, it's just a means of where you can, um, if you decide not to run agents on your virtual servers, you can do some agentless security scanning and auditing by scanning snapshots of the virtual disks. And um, as there's more and more of this going on, what you'll find is that in, in CloudTrail data at scale, the data that I look at, um, sharing snapshots happens up to 200,000 times per month. And so there's just, you know, it's just too large a haystack for us to try to hunt through. Um, actions like list buckets, list buckets is also heavily used not quite as much. It's it's more like up to 20,000 times per month at, at, at any scale. Um, but that's still, it's still, you know, a lot of events to try to sift through. Um, and in terms of, you know, like, could we, could we zero in on the user context? Not necessarily because these actions are often called from anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand user contexts at scale. And so trying to, you know, trying to pick out the few actions from one of maybe a few thousand users that are suspicious um, is, is hard to just, it's really hard to do through manual process. Um, get color identity is one of the even more heavily used actions. It can, you can see it up to 400,000 times per month in cloud API logs. Um, and so again, that's, you know, that's even larger and an and, and even harder problem. So then what about source IPs? So you notice that in some of these cases, they talk about people coming in from VPN providers or in one case from the Tor network. Um, so, can, you know, could we make a like a good list of like good IPs and look for anything else that's, you know, not a known good IP? Um, this doesn't really work either because um, the, so cardinality of source IP, cardinality basically means like the number of unique values at any given time. The, the cardinality or the number of unique source IPs in cloud logs can range from anywhere from tens of thousands to tens of millions. Why? Because um, even before COVID, these are highly distributed global cloud networks and they're highly distributed in there and they're highly dynamic. But in the post COVID world where we had people working from home, uh, we have activity, you have activity coming in from all over the place and people change locations and move around. So trying to reason about like, good like known and unknown source IPs is is really um, kind of infeasible to try to do this at scale. So in terms of anomaly detection, there's there's a couple of examples in here you can see right away. So in one case, the in the in the most recent case where we have the insider threat dimension, um, some of the activity like running get caller identity and and some of the transactions and operations that this user did um, would not have looked much different from what from their work that they did probably on any given day probably wouldn't have warranted a second a second look if we were if we were hunting in there on um however you notice that there's this then they talk about how this user uh, like in some some other cases this user then um came back a few minutes later but this time they're coming from uh, an IP provided by a VPN service. And so now while trying to make a list of good and bad IPs um, is pretty infeasible, um, one of the things we can do is that the, the, in many cases, when people use these VPN services, in many cases, they're, they're offshore. They're in uh, other geographies, other countries, sometimes that don't have normal business relationships. Sometimes they're in countries because they advertise that they don't engage in logging or they don't cooperate with law enforcement, things like now. Do they really do that? Well, who really, you know, who knows? And in, in most of the cases that I've read, it seems like it turns out that they actually, they actually don't, you know, they actually do have some logs and they actually do cooperate. But um, in many cases, if somebody's coming in from a VPN service or from Tor, it's likely that the user is going to be coming in from a totally different location 
than they normally do, and possibly a location or geography that they have never come, they've never um, come in from before. Um, same thing for actions. So this get color identity action that occurs at, at you know large scale at great volume. This get color identity action would have come in um, probably from a new when they came in from the VPN service. It would have come in from a new source geography for that action. <clears throat> probably one, and possibly a source geography like a source country or city or geography that we had not seen before for that action. Why? Because because we didn't have users previously using this this VPN service. So then one of the other things that I noticed in here is that um, the user apparently changed some lifecycle retention policies on certain certain logging um, data structures. This was probably a defense evasion um, attempt in order to reduce the logging window to one day in the in the hope being, I assume, that by the time anybody got around to investigating this, um, the the logs would have been, you know, rotated out of existence and there just would be insufficient evidence. Um, this is a case where so so logging um logging and lifecycle retention policies um are completely normal actions and they're not uncommon and you know as cloud environments and systems and, and worlds get spin up and torn down logging and retention policies will get turned on and turned off but in many cases that happens by that's that's performed by automation accounts or service accounts and it would be less usual it would be it would be a lot more a lot more odd a lot more strange to see a user doing this by hand to see a user going in and actually you know explicitly turning this down to one day um and so this could be this could be something that the user an action the user is taking for the first time it also could be uh, a new service that they're using for the first time um it could in this case they would have been working in um, a logging service called CloudTrail, which would have been something, could have been something new for the user. Oh, excuse me. So here's some example anomaly detections that we've created along these lines um, using some real world data. So in the first case, we have an unusual combination of um, method and role method being essentially that the action or the command the name of the command that was being used by the role and in this case you can see there's a role engaging in discovery activity by calling the describe instances command um that is something that's extremely unusual and by unusual i mean that it's an extreme outlier because you can see that that describe method that describe instances um command is normally used almost half a million times in this data. And that's completely normal. Um, you can think of describe instances as almost like, um, it's it's essentially just like, show me what virtual machine instances exist in this account. So anytime somebody loads that virtual, anytime somebody loads the page that lists virtual servers or automation um, takes inventory or you know any of, of possibly dozens of other things, this command will be used. And it's completely normal and completely benign. But in this case, we had a role calling this action um, that we really haven't seen before. And in the lower activity, um, in the lower card, we have an anomalous combination of an, of, of an event name or an action and a source geography, like I was just describing. And so like in the first case, the assume role event, so assume role is one of the most heavily used um, actions in in AWS, and it's it's the way that uh, instances and programs obtain privileges and permissions in order to do work. So they, um, virtual machine instances and pro and programs and clients um, are allowed to assume certain roles in order to in order to work in different services and in, in order to do various things. And so it's essentially a way of doing normal privilege management. Um, and you can see that. In this data set, there are actually 42 million instances of assume role. Um, and that's normal because, as I, you know, as I said, it's it's one of the most frequently used um, because it's just central to workflow. 
But of those 42 million, we have two of those coming from a from so just two of those are coming from a source country of China. And then in the third line, there are of the two million described instances event. Described instances is essentially saying, show me a summary information about either a particular virtual machine or all virtual machines. And of the like, not quite three million instances of of that action, of which, um, probably all but one of those are completely benign. Um, just one of those is coming from a source country, that is extremely rare. <laughs> Excuse me. So then, um, in addition to finding credential access patterns that we can imagine and that we know that we need to look for. One of the other um, one of the other great potentials for anomaly detection is that in general, and uh, you know, as there are emerging threats and emerging research, um, but in the cloud world in particular, there's a kind of a rapid period of evolution going on where there's there's a lot of security research going on and there are new techniques and tactics um, being discovered and published all the time. And so, you know, the upshot is that sometimes we we don't know what's coming next in, in the cloud threat domain. We don't always know what's coming next. We you know, we, but we know we we know that we're going to need to find it when it arrives, but we may not know what to look for yet. So this is a good example of that, where back in the January, February time frame, this was new research where this get federation token method was being used as a persistence mechanism to in order to survive evictions. Because it turned out that um, a compromised account could call this method and in order to uh, in, in obtain a persistence mechanism tactic that would survive, um, even if the original compromised account was disabled or the password was changed or that account was secured in some way, um, the, the federation token that they created would actually survive that process and could continue to be used to access the account. And so this is a case of, you know, up until January, February, it wasn't really widely known that this was something that we needed to look for and include in, in our threat hunting and detection, you know, set of things to look for. Um, but this is a case where the way we found this was, in addition to um, looking for things that are extremely sparse and extremely dense. So things like rare functions look for things that are extremely sparse. We have others that look for things that are extremely dense, like extremely large surges or spikes in certain errors can often be informative. But we're also looking for, in addition to rare, we're looking for um, new behaviors, like for example, a new action for a user, basically a command or a transaction um, by a user who has not used that command before. And so that's how we found this. So back in the late January, early February timeframe, we're able to find this action being used. Um, we're able to pick this out because it was being uh, called by a user who had not used it before. <clears throat> and so this is just a great example of how, you know, we could find this, even though we did not have, um, we did not have rules for this or threat intel or indicators. And we really like back in January, we really didn't know yet we needed to be looking for this. Um, but we can still find it using anomaly detection. So, so even though even when we don't know what's coming next and we don't know what to look for, sometimes we can still find what's coming next. So that is my talk. We're at the five minute warning. Um, that that is essentially my my summary talk on anomaly detection. And I'd be happy to take uh, any questions in the time we have. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Frank. That is awesome. And, and I completely agree with so much in your presentation. Many of the te techniques I use in my own investigations during incident response, for example, to help find a root cause and so on. Large data sets that are like, how do you even begin parsing this? Well, you, you start to count, you start to aggregate, and you start to see if you can source out the anomalies, look for the long tail of data and so on. Uh, and also I fully agree with the sentiment of like, like the attackers, they often become real users like it's so hard to differentiate between an attacker and just normal use of our application like like if i were an attacker which i am in many cases during pen testing once we put our foot on the inside it is typically via credentials of somebody else and we start to basically traverse the networks as somebody else and unless you have 
good ways of saying, hey, Bob's computer has never reached out to any of these other systems or he's becoming awfully saturated all of a sudden, like he becomes promiscuous all of a sudden. All of these little flags are so interesting to, to use as alerts. But what about those alerts, Craig? Are, are, are you seeing uh, like predominantly false positives or is, it, is there a mix between false positives and true positives? How, how, what, what's your thoughts and opinions about false positives when doing this anomaly detection? What I'm finding is, you know, having done this for several years, um, using, using rare functions on certain combinations um, has good sensitivity and specificities, but it does have some it does have some what you could consider false positive results um, that are not always actionable. So, so because in addition to um, finding suspicious activity, some rare functions can also find things that just happen, they're normal, but they just happen very occasionally. And so what I've found is that using a new function, looking for new combinations um, has um, signal to noise improvement over rare in some cases that's several hundred percent better. So even in cases where I have you know, at, at, at large scale, some people have um, north of 10 billion CloudTrail events per week. Um, but even at that scale, using certain new algorithms, I can still produce like a, a short list of maybe a half a dozen or so candidate detections. That is, you know, very reasonable, very modest and reasonable amount for, for a security team to process. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that is great. Being able to, to at least start threat hunting and have something tangible to, to fixate on and, and start to improve your security processes and learn more about your environment. Absolutely. I don't have any questions on the Slack right now. Uh, on your summary slide, what were the points again, Mark is asking on the Slack, uh, but other than that, I don't have questions on the Zoom or on Slack. So keep that in mind. If you do have a question, we have just a minute or so. And yeah, we do have a question coming in. So that's gonna be our last question. Oh, I do see several questions coming in now. But we got to make room for Emran coming in. So let's do one question and I'll post the others on Slack. So here's a question from Flora. Can't machine learning aid in detecting these anomalies? Great question. Yes, absolutely. So using anomaly detection, um, so there are, there are a couple of techniques. So, so anomaly detection based machine learning um, is, is a very, I found a very productive way of finding these. We're also working with some clustering techniques um, using algorithms like K-mean, for example, in order to find outliers. Um, there are some cases where some fields have cardinality that's a bit too high for, for anomaly detection techniques, um, but there's maybe cases where some other machine learning techniques may be useful as well. All right, awesome. All right, Craig, thank you so much for a, a very great presentation. I loved it.